Welcome to the Deadly Addiction channel. Today I'm going to be talking about episode 7 of Marvel's What If on Disney. So first off, this is a weird time going on in my life. Uh, I'm kind of recording these when I can and I'm only doing like once a week. I have a family emergency and um, I, I, I mentioned in the other ones, a couple, maybe a couple of the other ones, I wasn't sure if my you know, situation in life was impacting the show. And then maybe I guess this is a, well, you know, I don't have fucking fans, but maybe this is a reminder to not be so hard on myself. Okay, Joe? Anyway, getting to the episode, I enjoyed it for the most part, but I gotta say there are two silly moments for me. Like, there's too much silliness. However, again, trying to be, you know, somewhat unbiased. I think it's probably an episode I would have loved as a kid. You know, maybe my, you know, situation and the, the you know, like I explained, there's things that are going on or impacting things, but the theme is not new, the tropes, everything was a rehash, done very well. You're not going to fault it there. I think people are going to love this episode. So much fun going on, and you got an epic battle between Thor and Captain Marvel. So it hits a lot of great um, beats for me. I mean, you know what you know what's going on with Jane Foster, and I love the sidekick. The voice is again excellent, although Frigga's voice wasn't the original. But I'll take that in the sense of I'd rather give. You know, charity of thought, principal charity, whatever. Say, look, the actress didn't want to do it or couldn't do it. But I don't think it mattered. I think, who is it, Rene Russo? Her performances in the movies are enough to make me always envision her as um, Frigga, Thor's mother. But I don't think you need to worry about that here. I think if you have enough of the original actors, and you know what? Maybe you don't even need the original actors. I mean, that's how talented voice actors are. So, that, that, that didn't bother me. You don't have every single voice like Drax. It's not Drax. And if you go back to the other ones, it's not his voice. Uh, but when you have it and you can recognize it, it's, it is a, you know, a little um, cherry on top of the uh, cake. It just gives you a little bit of, um, you know, a, a little more immersion maybe. I mean, I've been a fan of Natalie Portman since The Phantom Menace. And although those movies aren't good, it always seemed like she was a star working with the best she had. And I loved her career. And her voice is here. And it's nice with uh, the Thor actor's voice, Hemsworth. And it just really goes well together. And again, the special effects, the cell animation type thing that they're carrying over. Again, uh, Sometimes I don't remember what day it is and the date or the fucking time, just, you know, in a fog. But, um, there's a, a chemistry between them. It works here. The weight to the animation, the sounds, it's all working really well. And I think it's, um, a huge achievement in that sense. There is a couple of things. So I've mentioned from the beginning, I don't like the Watcher depicted as eternity, meaning there's a conceptual being in the Marvel Universe who's an entity that represents the universe. And when he goes to these council meetings in the White Room or whatever you want to call it, his body is composed of like a, a window into the universe in the shape of a person. Weird shape. But anyway. So you're getting a little more of the Watcher's influence, but I think there's a distinction to be made here. In one of the other episodes, at the end of the episode, you, you, you saw it going somewhere, and then it was a dun, 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 one of those moments where at the end, you saw Thanos, uh, I think it was zombie Thanos, with a gauntlet with the Jets. So it's almost like saying here, here's a what if this happened, things change, but now that that thing has changed, there are some things that are immutable that are going to always happen, so someone will come to the thing. I think there might be a distinction to make here, and maybe it's a hint, an Easter egg. 
But if I'm correct, in this episode, the Watcher gives a hint that he's surprised. I think that could be a really big thing. Meaning, he's narrating these stories, and at the end, he's like, oh, Thor is... You know, he, he, Thor learns his lesson in a different way from the movies, right? So, he couldn't lift his hammer in movies. This one, it's, it's that, you know, my mom is, you know, the real boss. And I, like I said, I love some of the themes. Just a little too silly for me. I don't want to see Surtur, you know, and it's just little things. Little, little tiny nitpicks. Um, and there's a, so the episode kind of flows through fun, you know, and everything. And then at the end... Thor learns his lesson, and him and Jane are gonna, you know, pursue something in a sense, and Thor is like, blah, 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 and then all of a sudden, the Watcher says, like, something to your kin to, and they lived happily ever after, and then, you know, I gotta watch it again, like I said, my brain is just not, you know, because I'm only doing one podcast a week, which is hard for me, like I said, there's a situation going on, um, it's almost as if the watcher is saying things aren't going the way even he thought they were going. And is it alluding that he never knows? Like, he's telling the story that's in a fault. I didn't get that impression. I got that impression that he knew what, you know, he was describing to us as an alternate story. And so I'm not sure if they're trying to say this is a surprise. This is something different. And you can also look at it as, since it's one of the second things that have to do with a gauntlet and a, you know, and a teaser at the end. Could there be some kind of infinity war gauntlet going on? They've done things in the comics. I mean, I, I stopped collecting in like 2010, 2008, 2010 ish. So I'm not the greatest authority on this. Although I do look at some of the channels that are out there, like Comic Pop, and um, I don't know, you give props to people, uh, comic is, comic story, in and whatever. You can look at them up there, out there. And you can, I follow some of the storylines, but I don't know. If they're going to do a War of Gauntlets or... I mean, they've done kind of similar things, although there's the impression in the Marvel comics that the Gauntlets only work in their respective universe. But what happens when you have all these divergent paths, a multiverse, and each universe is... One of the immutable facts is someone's going to put together the gems and form a gauntlet of some sort. It doesn't have to be a gauntlet, obviously. In this one... It looks like, spoilers, you know, warning, whatever. It looks like that this is Ultron Vision with the gem. So it's got this Ultron, uh, like, I guess his pathway in Age of Ultron movie is um, he, he was going to make Vision's body for himself. Well, just something to that extent and kind of coinciding with the comic origins. All right, so this is a Ultron vision body with the gems. But what would be so surprising about that to put it in the show? And I could see there being an alternate what if vision, uh, Ultron became vision, and, and then he gets the gauntlet. By using these shortcuts and some of the writing, um, you know, the things that you learn about when you study writing in some classes. I wonder if they're doing certain things and on purpose playing with the elements or let's say the foundations of writing. I think there's a really good chance that this could be a really interconnected weaving of stories like I've discussed in the past. Uh, one of my first uh, ideas about the show when I was watching, because I really loved the first one, uh, was, will they ever come back? Like, could you see an episode being so popular or a premise of an episode being so popular that they want to revisit it? But what if they thought about that before they aired? Now, it could be risky, right? Because you're writing out, let's say they wrote 16 episodes and they're going to break it up into 8 and 8. So their path would be, let's show them the concept of what if, Blah, 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 blah. You got these episodes. What if this? What if that? And then tie them into a grander story about the multiverse and connect them. So you might see um, Captain UK, Peggy Carter, you know, interact with the 
Doctor Strange, which is one of the little hints that someone brought to my attention. And, you know, so what are they doing with the foundation of the story? Because it can get wildly out of control. It can just keep getting insane, and you're going to have a solid and, you know, loyal fan base. I'm not saying, you know, that because the show is fun in that sense. But how deep do you need to go to understand what they're doing in the stories? So I'm kind of excited in that sense, Uh, as someone who thinks he's a writer, probably deluding himself. But there's a question here, like, why put this highlight at the end? Why wasn't it zombies? Oh, let's say, let's go to the Marvel zombie episode. You have this episode about zombies, and it kind of could infer that, okay, so Thanos comes anyway, but he's a zombie. In this one, we have Party Thor. Right? He comes down to a planet, they party hard, and it kind of was a... See, and it was another subplot that they didn't really uh, hit on enough for me, or... um, I thought it was going to go somewhere else, so... Party Thor comes to Earth, shit's hitting the fan, it's spreading. This parties are going on, and it's starting to spread. And here's where some of my little nitpicks came in, because... In his party, brings in... Like every fucking character from every, um, you know, storyline. And since we've got Guardians of the Galaxy there and, and things like that. And Surtur is there. And I thought it was ridiculous. I kind of got annoyed. And like I said, it is an understanding of what I'm going through. And so I thought that when they introduced Loki as, you know, because the episode is actually what if Thor were an only child. Now, I should have said that from the beginning, but like I said, my brain is... Maybe I did say it. I don't even fucking know. Um, so you have the same actual Loki, which I thought was kind of stupid, but I get where they were going. I'm sure people loved it. And I thought there was going to be some, some plot of, though you think you're partying on planets, but you're destroying them. Because one of the little things was, before this, Jane Foster found uh, indications, and it was revealed that uh, the planet was destroyed after Thor party there. And is that sort of a little plot where it's revealed, no, he went there and party, but it was really just meteors and asteroids. And was it his fault? And then there was a kind of never really resolved one. Maybe, like I said, sometimes I'm in a fog or, you know, I'm just going through the motion, so to speak. And that didn't pan out in a sense. And then S.H.I.E.L.D. calls Captain Marvel because, you know, the device she left Fury because Fury got knocked over by Korg, you know. And, um, so where would that flow into me inferring that Vision was going to come? And one thing occurred to me was how much Vision seemed to be enthralled with Thor. Like, when when Vision first uh, comes into play, it's his, I think when he looks at Thor is when he makes his cape. And you get this impression when he's, uh, he hands Thor the hammer and... Tony Stark makes a great fucking joke or uh, uh, an inference like, um, um, you know, why? Because part of the movie is them trying to lift a hammer, no one can, although Cat might have moved it a little bit. And when Vision's only, he's like, oh, it's just like putting the um, hammer in an elevator because, you know, he's a synthetic being. And as much as I think Age of Ultron isn't the best Marvel movie that they've made, I enjoy it. So. All right. So, why interject Vision comes with the gem? So, is this saying, what if Thor were an only child, and this is his story of how he gains that humanity? Because he alluded that him and Loki's uh, childhood and growing up had taught him lessons, but not really, because that's what the Thor Thor movie is about, him being arrogant, you know. Maybe he's not a warmonger, he's a partier, which is okay, fine. So in that case, are we saying in this episode, the Avengers aren't formed yet, like because Party Thor came to Earth, they had to call Captain Marvel, they didn't seem to refer to other heroes in the general sense, except he's bringing in all the Guardians of the Galaxy, so again, it might just be my brain, but okay. So, you got the tropes, you got this story we've all seen before, done well. Like I said, I enjoyed the episode. 
Thor is a party arrogant, blah, 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 comes down, threatens Earth's peace because he's partying too much. There is no subplot that there's Loki infecting people or whatever, which is kind of what I thought might happen. And from this, instead of Thanos arriving, yeah, I guess you could have really solidified this joining of uh, episodes or concept if the zombie Thanos showed up with the gems, right? Like, there's a... Somebody's manipulating these pathways of time and space and these alternate universes. But why Vision? Like, what would connect this story to Vision being Ultron and whatever? So, again, it's just me conjecturing, just thinking, because like I've said in a lot of these, I grew up with the comics. I, I'm really um, big, a big nerd about these things. But there's a weirdness to this uh, concept that I think is unique and um because it's one thing to say you know I'm making a one of the things like Justice League International like after the Justice League did like two seasons they went to an international and every episode had dozens of fucking heroes some were obscure and you don't really have to tie in the story so isn't it always like that yeah but the, the core concepts stay the same so when you watch some of these DC movies, because I use DC because their cartoon movies are just fabulous, they're numerous, and just like Marvel's Marvel movies, there's so many good ones that are, it outweighs some of the bad ones they did, and maybe they're not even bad in that sense that they just don't agree with me, right? So you have the core concept, but it's different to say, what if Superman grew up in Russia, or you know, some other thing, and he has different um, ideals, he has different, he, doesn't, he wasn't raised by Martha and whatever can it's more akin to that, and week after week, you know, you're, you're playing with that concept. And I think it's a little dangerous. It's uh, in a good way. It's, um, you know, a unique way to commit to a concept. And could there be layers upon layers that they've planned on? Um, but if I'm not going to connect the tissue and say that, uh, you know, because we didn't see zombie. They know what the gauntlet we saw vision. Maybe somewhere in their things, their concept is every universe that's splitting off, they will all get a con- concept of the gems. And uh, Marvel did a thing where the Ultraverse uh, connection with the Phoenix and stuff, and Ruin has these gems and they're like shards. And you can just make that concept go into every type of university. So they might not be the same size the same shape you know whatever but is there going to be a c uh a variety of gauntlet users in, in a certain sense i personally would like to see the original infinity watch done in this somehow now i'm not sure how you can do that because you haven't shown warlock you do have drax and gamora so you're missing, you know, Warlock, uh, Moon Dragon, and uh, Pip. And that's just like a little thing, but they were after the Gaunt was formed, and in the comics, when the dust settles, it's Adam Warlock who gets the Gauntlet. And I don't think it happens in the epi- in the comic line itself of that story, but it's revealed, I think, in his own separate thing or limited thing. That upon going to this council of entities like uh, eternity and death and infinity and, like I said, as a conceptual beings of the universe, he comes to the, I guess, the revelation, the awareness that he's not fit enough to be a god, and that was always his dealing, was always his method of dealing with Thanos. And Thanos always fails because he doesn't believe he's worthy. So, if you piece together some of the comments, Adam Warlock's got the gauntlet, and in a moment of omnipotence and such, he decides to split the gems up, and he keeps the soul gem, which he's had in those in the comics for a variety of runs, and each person gets the a gem, and there's the Infinity Watch, and that's how it was formed. And I maybe they might go that way. Like I could see. This being such a problem in not in that it's a good or a bad episode, but a problem in the concept of the weavings. That's one of the resolutions to this could be 
showing the original Infinity War. It's like, I don't know. It's just something that occurred to me. So, this was What If, Thor, an Only Child. Episode 7 of Marvel's What If. It's on Disney. And I'm going to say, it's like, I think it's hitting the right beats. It's, it's um, exceptional to watch, to understand myself, the, the way sound and the way things feel and the way things carry momentum. These, um, idea maybe of combining animation techniques is working for me. So, voice acting. I mean, there's so many good things to like, and I'm just really nitpicking about things that just annoy me at the time. And thinking about the last month of my life and what's going on and what's ultimately happening now, it could be just, you know, I'm just in a stage of life that. I'm getting annoyed at things a little bit more I'm not so conscious of. But I could at least try to be honest and say, I can see people loving this episode. I found it charming and, you know, delightful in a sense. But somewhere the threshold of being silly kind of just went overboard. And I don't think that's, in a sense, bad writing. And Well, maybe someone could analyze it and be right. But it's bad decision making. No, huh? You know, it's what the story you want to tell. I wrote my book, and if I have certain pathways that the characters, because I have a concept of, you know, 11 novels, or whatever it is. Yeah, I mean, people are going to say, you know, what decision, oh, you should have went this way, and maybe in hindsight that would fix things or make it better in my head, but, you know, I don't know. People made the decision to make this funny, cute, and romantic in a very sensible way. It's not lost on me. Very enjoyable. And like I said, uh, you know, uh, I wish it was a, a way to, um, you know, untangle my biases. But we're humans, and I think that's how it works, sadly. So, hope everybody's doing well. Um, I still recommend the show. I mean, uh, I, don't, I still recommend the show. Almost every episode I've liked. One, I did, two, I didn't wasn't interested in but i could see the you know greatness i, I talked to a friend once and I, I was like i'm at least humble enough to say pink floyd was a great band i can't fucking stand listening to them maybe once or twice i'll hear a song and i'll leave it on or it's something but i don't want to listen to pink floyd and i'm not going to sit around and go call it shit so i might not like um parts of the procedure here and there decisions you make and you know making things too silly or telling a story i really don't have an interest in but i think on the merits that matter the show's doing good i recommend what if watch it give it a shot and the concept could be a little wacky but i think it works so be well everybody my best to you and yours